If not, then I would uh, have you please do not forget that the uh, moon will be visible from Earth tonight. The last time this happened was last night. <laughs> I'll give a real short explanation. A lot of people have been asking me about this eclipse coming up, and I will just uh, share just a little bit right before our time of prayer. <laughs> to be here the week after our Christ arose from the grave. Now we ask that as we take up our tithes and offerings that you would bless the gift as well as the giver and we do this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
A lot of people just had a lot of comments. So I thought I would uh, join in and kind of stir the pot a little bit. And I asked the question, uh, do we have to wear a mask? <laughs> Got a lot of sarcastic answers back. It's simply an act of nature as this world goes through the process of coming to the end when Jesus will return. And I think there are four little short verses that kind of wrap up uh, what's going on. And it comes to us from the 21st chapter of Luke in just four verses, the 25th verse. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth there will be distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves will roar men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heaven shall be shaken talking about the rapture. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Preparation for our time of prayer, the Psalms 119, verses 105 through 112. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according to, unto thy word. Except I beseech thee the free will offerings of my mouth. O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. My soul is continually in my hand, yet do I forget not thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, and I erred not from my, thy precepts. Thy testimonies have I taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing in my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even until the end. Let us pray. Good morning, our most gracious Heavenly Father in Heaven. We present ourselves this morning for your glory. We come to receive a lamp unto our lives, that light coming from Christ. And in turn, help us to become the light of this world. We worship you and we love you with all of our hearts, our minds, and our souls. We ask that you will remind us of all that you have done for us through the cross of Calvary and all that you are doing for us through our relationship with you. Oh God, the world is constantly setting traps and snares, but through your written word, and with your holy comforter, we have confidence that we will persevere and one day experience that great day of entering into and through the gates of heaven. As the master physician, we ask that you remember those who are ill and in the hospital. As the master carpenter, we pray that you will build in us a house that is built upon the rock and not upon the sand. As the master farmer, we pray that we will grow where we are planted to witness your loving grace and promises. And as the master soldier, we ask that you watch over our men and our women who are serving in our military and all those first responders. We lift up the Reverend Dwight Bishop who is going through some procedures and we pray for him and for his wife. We lift up Gary Schwartz who is recovering from some procedures and also with Jennifer Shiflett 
and all of the other unspoken prayers. For it is in your Son's name, Jesus, that each of us has been taught how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
And everybody said, Amen. Indeed, we are made free, not by our works, but by the grace of God. <coughs> Our scripture this morning is a story, it's a parable. A parable always gives us insights, directions, perception, and directions to an eternal life in heaven. Our story this morning that Jesus himself told, this is in Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 1 through 13. Then shall the kingdom of heaven, notice that it says kingdom of heaven, not kingdom of God. We are in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven will be after our resurrection. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took all their oil in the vessels, plus more with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them and sell and buy for yourselves. And when they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and when they were ready, went in with him to the marriage, and the door shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I don't know you. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. In my ministry spanning over many years, I have officiated at many weddings, many marriages. No two were ever alike. Some were big and very formal. I even had some shotgun weddings. <laughs> Extravagant receptions. Steak and lobster and fine wine. Had some where everybody met at the local diner, paying for their own meals. I've officiated, or not quite completed, weddings where the bride did not show up. Also, some where the groom did not show up. So today we're going to be talking about a wedding, but Unless we are familiar with the culture of the times, our parable will not make much sense, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Verse 2 of our scripture this morning tells us that there are ten young women, and from outward appearances, they all look the same. They all have wedding clothes on. They're dressed for a time of celebration and a marriage. And as we will learn, some of them were all dressed up but really didn't have any place to go. Verse 5 tells us that the groom did not show up when they all expected. So some of them got tired and just went to sleep. All was quiet in verse 7. And all of a sudden they heard the groom approaching. So they woke up the others and they began one by one to light their lamps. Now there's a difference with these young ladies. Five are wise and five are foolish. The wise were well-versed and had knowledge that many times things do not happen on our schedule. So five of these damsels took not only the oil in their lamps, but also extra oil, just in case the groom was late. The foolish only took enough oil for one lighting of their lamps. Fawn will run her truck down to the very bottom 
And I say, honey, you need to stop and get some gas after she tells me she's been running on empty for six or seven weeks. <laughs> she says, well, it tells me that I still have seven miles left. <laughs> I keep waiting for that phone call <laughs> because I know it's coming where she calls me up and says, honey, I have run out of gas. But after what I have shared publicly today, I'll probably be the very last person <laughs> on the face of this earth if she recalls. <laughs> for me, if I get anything lower than a half a tank, I become afraid. <laughs> the young ladies knew the saying, the wise ladies, be prepared long before the Boy Scouts used that saying. We Christians, being ready and being prepared is more than just a lifestyle. It's a relationship. A relationship with the bridegroom with Christ Jesus. As Christians and as a Christian church, we want to always be prepared and we want to project our theme and reason and motive and agendas for meeting. And that is to receive an ample amount of oil. So the bridegroom tarries. We will have sufficient spiritual oil. Verse 8 goes on to say, we, we see these other five that were foolish in that they assumed that the groom would show up when they thought he would and he should arrive. They ran out of oil. They wanted the wise young ladies to share their oil. Why, it's the Christian thing to do. Well, there are some things that just cannot be shared. Faith cannot be shared or loaned. Knowledge cannot be borrowed. You have to study for your own test. Verse 9 says, if you're out of oil, the wise said, you need to go to Walmart. They sell oil there. Pick some up so that you'll have sufficient oil. That is, go to Christian pastors and churches and teachers who have spiritual oil. But we're being told, don't wait too long. Verse 10 says, but then while the foolish five went to the store to get oil, in those moments, the bridegroom showed up. And there was no more waiting. The doors were closed and the marriage ceremonies began. Verse 11, when the foolish five show up interestingly with oil, they began to pound on the door, yelling and screaming, open up the door, we have the oil. Verse 12 says, but the bridegroom heard all of the commotion. He looked back and said, would you quiet down? My marriage is now being performed. The wedding will be complete. And besides, I don't know you. I don't know you. No sadder words have ever been spoken in the Holy Scriptures. Then I'm sorry, but I never knew you. The word no in scriptural language and definition means a relationship. As a man knows his wife and as the wife knows her husband. It is an intimate relationship. Verse 13 gives us a warning. We do not know the hour or the day that the Lord will return. But we do know the season. And my friends, we are in 
that season. Jesus uses a wedding illustration to explain heaven and the way there and how we are to receive eternal life. Of course, most of you are of the wise and have come to understand and know Christ and you can clearly see what Jesus is saying. If you are not assured of a heavenly kingdom, today is the day that you can become satisfied in knowing that you will be present at the wedding. You see, in our story of metaphors and illustrations and examples, the wedding is the rapture, the catching up of the church. The bridegroom is Jesus. The virgins are the world and many church people. The lamp is filled or is not filled with oil, and that oil is faith, obedience, and righteousness. So, we must go back for a few moments and understand this illustration Jesus gives, and that is understanding, including the culture of that time, knowing these times will make this parable make more sense. The first thing is in the first century, the bridegroom was much more important than they are today. The bridegroom in a fancy wedding is almost secondary. You gotta have him. But the emphasis is placed upon the bride. Weddings were different. First came the engagement, and they were arranged by the parents. The grooms settled on a dowry, and the marriage covenant was established. What happened was the fathers of the prospective bride and groom met and discussed certain issues. And then when those issues were agreed upon, the date was set ambiguously. Now there is the myth that parents arranged the weddings and the marriages and the people had no say in it. That is a myth. It's not true. It's not historical. It's not documented. Let me tell you what happened in everyday life. There was a young man and he was walking down the street and he looked over and there were a group of girls giggling, carrying on, probably talking about him. <laughs> and he spotted one of them. And he went home and his dad says, what were you doing? He said, well, I was coming from the shop and on the way I saw this group of girls and dad, I want to tell you, there was one there that when I looked at her, shivers ran up and down my back. I looked out at my hands and they began to shake. And his dad said, so you think that might be a prospective bride? Dad, please, go talk to her dad. Well, her, his father said, okay, son, if you think that's the one you want, I know it is. So his father went to her father, and he said, my son has his eyes upon you, upon your daughter, and he's interested in marrying her. And so the father of the young lady says, well, that's great. You're from good family, and you have good character, and I've seen your young man around town, and he looks like he'd make a good husband. Let me talk to my daughter. Now, this is how it really happened in the old Jewish tradition. So the father went to the daughter and he said, guess what, honey? This young man <coughs> taunted you and he would like for you to consider being his bride. And she begins to giggle and laugh. And she says, oh, father, <laughs> that is wonderful. I've had my eye on him a lot longer than he's had his eye on. Yes, go tell his father I'm willing to be his bride. 
Now, I've added some contemporary thoughts in there, but the procedure and the process is 100% true. Somewhere down through history, we've lost that. We've forgotten about it. Now, this period took about a year. And uh, they were able to uh, see each other during that year. If there were parties to go to, oh, they were well chaperoned. There was no touchy-touchy, feely-feely going on. But that gave a chance for this prospective bride and groom to meet and to share. And during that time is to investigate and discover if there, in fact, was a possible bond between the two of them, that they actually liked each other. Because there were times where marriages were just simply called off. But many times and most times they were not. And after that year, and during that year, the young man went and he built a home, built a house for him and his new bride to live in. When the groom was all done with making his house in order, became so excited that he could not wait till the next morning to go tell his bride, I'm done with the house. We can now get married. He lit his lantern in a hurry and would proceed to the bride's house. Now the bride, of course, was expecting him as they were engaged. She didn't know the exact time. She didn't know the day. But she knew the season. She kept her eye on her prospective husband building that house. And when he began to put the final coat of paint and put locks on the door and wash the windows, she knew it was not going to be long. The wedding and weddings were usually held at night so that there needed to be lamps. As the groom arrived, there was always a shout which announced that the groom had arrived and all the community could wake up. Words were exchanged between the two and the covenant was sealed forever. The wedding usually lasted about seven days. Remember the wedding in Cana of Galilee? Jesus was there. During these seven days, the bride and the groom stayed in their bridal chamber with the door locked. At the end of the seven days, the groom came out and all of the community hushed and there was quietness and they were waiting for his word. And these are the words that the groom said. The marriage has been consummated. In that bridal chamber, there was a candle. The Jewish tradition is there were three people present. There was the bride and the groom and the Holy Spirit. And when that wedding became consummated and turned into a marriage, the Holy Spirit was there. And when the young man came out and said, it's been consummated, that agreement was between three people, bride, the groom, and the Holy Spirit. So now, hopefully and prayerfully, you have caught on by now that this parallels with the coming of Christ and the, the, the necessity for being prepared. Jesus uses this story to illustrate the truth. All are expecting his coming and that he will arrive at any moment, but not all are going with him. Five were wise and five were foolish. 
Now, I'll bet you're wondering how I'm going to get a railroad story out of this. But I got one. The worst sin that a conductor could make back when conductors rode in cabooses, their job was to be in charge of the train and to look ahead from the cab, from the gondola, from the top of the caboose. And if they spotted any fires or any uh, brakes that were holding up on the wheels, uh, they couldn't radio or walkie-talkie, but they all had lanterns. And they had different colored lanterns. This one happens to be a blue lantern. And this one, I think, said all is well. And the conductor would hang his lantern out of the caboose, and the brakeman on the front engine would always keep his eye on the conductor in the back. And when he saw this lantern waving, he knew all was well. There was a different colored lantern for danger, for what they call a hot box, which is a wheel that's dragging and will cause a fire. And the worst sin that the conductor could make would be not to have sufficient oil. This particular little bottle of oil made by the Thomas A. Edison oil people. And he always made sure that he had enough oil because if the oil was not there, the train could derail. If oil is not present in your church. You need to change pastors. If oil is not present with him or her that is teaching you Christianity, you need to change teachers. If the friends around you do not have oil, you may need to think about changing friends. That's the oil represented in our story. Now there's another use for this oil, and I was not a trainman, I was in communications and signals, and along the way we had uh, battery boxes that kept up the lines and made the signals go up and down. And we had uh, batteries that were wet cell batteries, they were humongous, and they were filled with water and it turned into acid. But those batteries had a problem. And the problem was that the water in the batteries would evaporate, and when that water evaporated, the battery lost all of its energy. It lost its function as a battery. So what we did was we took these little oil bottles, and we popped the top on them, and we poured oil on top of the water. And guess what? the water did not evaporate. You see, in the church, we have the faith and the obedience, but we need the oil on top to make sure that as Christians, we do not evaporate. It is so easy to evaporate. Now, these young women could see the danger. The Bible the Bible that you and I use is timeless. It transcends, that is, it is not dependent upon time, geography, politics, government, culture, language. Time, you see, is a creation of God. In heaven, there is no hours or minutes. Sadly, the same is true in hell. Time is a creation just like this world. God created the creatures and the trees and the oceans, the deserts, the north and the south poles. The scriptures are as current today as they were when Jesus was telling this parable. I just told it, and it's relevant. 
2,000 years ago. It's been said that the oldest thing in the world is yesterday's newspaper or last night's TV news. Nothing needs to be added, deleted, revised to accept God's up-to-date word, current information of this world is relevant through the scriptures. Currently, I just have three short points I want to share with you. Firstly, the world. There was the creation. That's done. There was God's covenant with man. That's done. There was man wandering away from his love and from the covenant that he made with them. We know that's done. God supplied a sacrifice both in the Old and the New Testaments. And that's done. Then there was the age of the prophets. Well, that's over. There was the age of the kings. That too is over. There was the age of the priests. That's over. Then there was the coming of the Messiah. His message, his dying for our sins, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He preached that in order to forgive and to receive forgiveness, we must repent. A message that is lost just like the original wedding in many of our contemporary churches. The idea of confessing our sin is foreign, not needed. But regardless, that's done. Then comes the age of the apostles preaching an apostolic message that Jesus gave to them. And now, the age of the church, the church age. And this, my folks, is the end. There is no age after all the ones that we've just mentioned. There is no age after the church age. This is the last age. And this is where we are right at this very moment. We have come from our journey. And let us, let there be light so that we as a church giving light to a world full of darkness and revealing to the world what is good. But this is where some people will get hung up. It's also our calling to reveal to the world what is bad. It's not fun to give. It's not very positive. It doesn't really make us feel good. But we need to preach good and we need to preach what is bad. Otherwise, how are my people to know? Sometimes that becomes offensive, uncomfortable. You see, biblical Christianity is unpopular. Popular Christianity is unbiblical. Jesus said that upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When Jesus left and went back to his Father, he sent a comforter, the Holy Spirit. So now as we are part of the body of Christ, we have been commissioned. Matthew 28 says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always and even until the end of the world. Sorry, modern day, you get something that the rest of us don't, preachers. There's no new revelations. God has not given TV preachers or any 
new revolution or revelation person. New and new news that nobody has heard before. We hear some of them saying it though. Last night God told me something you've never heard before. Well then my friend, if I've never heard it before, it's most likely a lie. Because God has told us everything he wants to tell us from the first verse of Genesis to the 22nd chapter of Revelation. There's nothing more. This parable is preparing us for the rapture, the second coming of Christ. You've heard me say it a hundred times in my sermons. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed. Today's language would be, we don't want you to be stupid about those who are sleeping, that is, those who have died. That you will arise at the shout and all will be lifted up in that time of rapture. Revelation 22, verses 6 and 7 says, And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true, and the Lord God of his holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Finally, you and me, we have been given a royal invitation to the uniting of Christ and his church. I pray you are one of the five wise. Five broad oil and even extra. I praise God that I'm a Christian. And more than that, I praise the Lord that he called me and not because of anything that I've done. Not because of any personal righteousness I have. But he did something more. He called me to be his minister and so he gave me sufficient information and insights and discernment into the Holy Scriptures not to keep them to myself but to share them with you. The oil is placed on top of your battery so that your faith and your obedience and your discernment and your knowledge will not evaporate. But God's oil, his truth, his righteousness, and our obedience to him will remain intact. That's why we come to church. We come to church to have our oil changed. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I come to church a quart low. And I need another court before I go back out into the world. The oil is the Bible. The oil is the repentance. The oil is forgiveness, restoration, salvation, redemption, and sanctification. We're the water. But we need the oil to give us life and to keep our batteries charged. We can't share our faith. We have to receive it from God himself. All scripture, we're told, is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, reproof for correction, for instruction in righteousness 2,000 years ago. That's not true. It's as true today as it was then. Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. cannot share our faith other than sharing what God has done for us but each person must have their own faith I will end with the story that Jesus told in Matthew 20 then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons worshipping him and desiring certain things of him 
And he said unto her, what, what do you want, woman? She kept following him, couldn't get rid of her. And she said unto him, grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you don't know what you're asking. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? He knew what was coming. And to be baptized with the baptism that I've been baptized with. And they said unto him, Yeah, we're able. And he said unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup. And be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to give. But it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. I'll confirm that 99.99% of you have been confirmed. Have a well. And you came today to have your oil topped off. And that when you leave this sanctuary, that you will be able to go out into the world and share Jesus. Because your faith will be intact, you will be obedient, you will be discerning, because your water, your living water, the water that flows through you, will not evaporate. But I'm telling you along about Friday or Saturdays, it's going to get a little low. <laughs> and you need to come back to church. We represent all of this with Holy Communion. This is life-giving substance. It's a symbol. And as we drink of the blood, we are reminded that Jesus gave his life for us. And the bread, of course, is the bread of life. And that's exactly what we've been talking about today. So we come to receive God's love, his message, and for us to be filled with his oil. We'll see our shop at home. I always forget a bag and I've got a bottle. Father, for this opportunity, for this command, for this privilege, we come to you now and present ourselves unworthy, unworthy to even pick up the crumbs that might fall down on the floor. But we come by invitation, and we come to remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and the oil for our life. Bless these sacraments, and as they enter into our bodies, our bodies will enter into your service. In Christ's name, amen. If you will please uh, wait to receive the sacrament and then all of us will receive it at the same time.
eat and drink and do this in remembrance of him. Let us turn on our hymnals to hymn number 314. 314. What a day that will be. Verse 1. 314. Make me. 